after I got found guilty and I was standing in that dock in front of the judge, he said to me, if I ever came back in these courtrooms again, he would lose me in the system. That really scared me. I was thinking my life as a footballer is over before it even started. I knew then that I needed to turn my life around. My name is Jamie Lawrence. I was born in Ballam, South London Hospital on the 8th of March 1970. It's an old ladies hospital. It's not there that I'm old, though. Back in the day, it was a bit rougher than it is now. It's gone up, up market now. But it was a great community back in the day and that, and great times and sad times at the same time. Them sort of years and that was really hard, especially for black families and that, because there's only five black families on the estate. So at first, um, people started trying to bully us and get racial abuse and whatever. But then when my mum was one of those people, like, if we came in crying, she would walk us out, walk us outside, and we would have to fight. And she'd be like, what am I feeding you for? So after a while, people never wanted to fight you no more because they knew they were going to get something back. My mum and dad, like, thinking about it now, I could have wished for two better parents than my mum and dad, and uh, they came over, I think, in the 60s, and, uh, and they worked their fingers to the bone just to put food on the table for the kids and that. We never went without. Very, very strict. You knew where you stood with your mum and dad. Seen or not heard was a f favourite phrase. But um, they were fully justified in the things what they were strict on. And it was never far wrong. This is where it all used to happen. This is home coming into Dunstan Road Estate now. It looks small now. Back in the day, it was massive. Dunstan Road for me was quality to live, live on like, got always near enough everyone around the estate. You, you have your, your falling outs and that, but for, for me in Dunstan Road, sport was everything for us, love. Here now was my old address, number six, Dunstan Road. It was a great community, especially after we earned the right. You know, it was a good community after that. Like, everyone looked after each other, everyone looked out for each other. It's strange being back here, to be fair. It brings back a, a lot of memories and that. This is where it all started for me. At football, my, my primary school was just down the road there, um, what I went to. And we used to have a football pen just down there where we spent most of our time. This is where it all began. <laughs> it looks tiny in there now, to be fair. We used to play like 11 aside in there and that. I can't imagine playing 11 aside in there now, by the way. It was a lot smaller. Well, maybe I've grown a little bit as well. We was in there from morning till night time. Every single day, no days, we never came in there. Uh, all the boys would come here. I was more dedicated than a lot of them know. I'll make sure I'm here first, and I went home last. I've not been there now since, like, 33 years in this pen. And it's kind of surreal now, the journey what I've been on, and now to be finally back here and that, kind of surreal, mate. Every school I went to, like primary school, I was always one of the best in my year, or if not the best in my year. My teacher, Mr. Airy, one of the, they don't make them like him no more. All about winning back in the day. He made me realise that I was special at sport because he went out and bought me my first pair of football boots because my mum and dad couldn't afford it back in the day. By the age of 17, my mum and dad moved back to Jamaica and my life took a different path. I began a slippery slope of crime to survive, which came to a head at a local snooker hall in 1989. 
one day we'd been drinking the night before and I've gone in there early. Till was there. And um, I opened the till. The manager's come out and caught me. And then um, he's told me to put um, put the money back on that. But um, I've turned around through probably embarrassment more than anything and beat him up, took the money and got out of there. I then ended up getting arrested, ended up getting three years, and it was my first time being in prison. When I came out, I was like, I'm going to go on a straight and narrow, um, this and that. But when you come out, you can't get no job. I was out six weeks, and then I got myself into trouble again. We're on um, Gideon Estate, right near the Crown Pub, where um, my second crime where I went to prison for happened. When I was in prison on my first sentence, my friend was getting bullied by this person. So when I came out, we saw him, and I said to my mate, listen, go on, here's your chance now. I'm out now, so I'll protect you. And my friend started fighting him, which wasn't doing too well. So I jumped in, um, started beating him up. He tried to run off. I caught up with him, um, beat him up and robbed him, which probably I'm not proud of that side of it, but that's how it was back in the day. I got arrested and then got remanded in custody because I was on trial um, at Kingston Crown Court. It only took him like 55 minutes um, to find me guilty, so I was thinking, like, my life is over before it's even started, and all I'm going to be doing now for the rest of my life is being in crime. I've got four years, um, and I've sent to Camp Hill Prison on the Isle of Wight. Um, for my sentence, it's the worst prison for my sentence. It's a really tough prison. Obviously, I've just turned 21. I'm really scared um, getting into that prison, into a men's environment. You never knew what to expect, and that but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. My name's a PE at Camp Hill Prison. It's an old prison that um, housed CATSI prisoners uh, under training for um, various jobs to try and get them uh, into work outside. The first memories was being very scared when I was coming through them gates and that. At the beginning of my four-year sentence, I've heard a lot about the Isle of Wight. This was the most violent prison for the four-year sentence I was going, going into. So, you know, you had to be on your toes and that. Well, I think um, to bandy about model prisoner was um, is probably the easiest way to describe him because he was good and he was absolutely no trouble at all to us. They had a lot of sport, which took my mind off a lot of it. And obviously football became my saviour when I came into it. We, we played an inter-win competition and then I started playing for the prison side. Jamie was obviously an outstanding footballer right from the word go. Um, we had him in the gymnasium um, just um, on odd, odd occasions uh, playing football. Uh, and then gradually we made him a gym orderly so that he could get himself fit and uh, we could um, have a good look at him and uh, see what we could do with him. Well, I never thought nothing of it at first, but um, obviously I wanted to play football. I played football in, against into wings and that. But um, it was quite like my wing had never won the tournament. And I'd only been there about two weeks, three weeks, and then they see me play and said, oh, can, do you want to play for them? Said, yeah, no problem. And it just came at the right time that we had Cows Football Club coming in on a boxing day to play um, the inmates. Jamie played extremely well, and that really was the start of getting him to play for Cows. I scored two goals against Cows Sports. Um, one with a winner in the 80-something minute. And that's the beginning of the story. I'm 
Dale Young. I was Cow Sports football manager many years ago. He was so strong on the ball. You couldn't get near him and you couldn't uh, knock him off the ball. He was pretty good in the air, even though he had trouble heading it with his air do. And then we, we just took the steps to try and get him out on day release with me. I never thought it would happen, to tell you the truth. But then the closer it would come to my home leave and that, they were saying, yeah, it can happen. There were obvious complications because um, it was not done before. That was the first thing. I went to the number one governor who was extremely uh, cooperative. As long as I escorted Jamie to the home games to start with, that was okay. And then gradually, Dow was allowed to pick him up and take him to the home games and then eventually to the away games, which were all on the mainland, of course. So it was a progression uh, of which, you know, we had to make sure things worked properly for him. Um, and he repaid that by behaving and um, it went from there. Jamie was, he was the instrument. We used, everyone who got the ball, we tried to give it to Jamie. So at least we had a target man, but he was physical, he was strong, he was so fit compared to us. He had a great influence on the team. And the fans here, the fans used to love him. We'd get 200 more fans just get Jamie was playing. Obviously, the first game I came to play here, um, it's very nerve-wracking because I don't care how good you are, but you still want to get the respect of your, your teammates and that. I think we won 2-1 or something like that. And the team, my teammates made me feel really, really welcome. I'd never played in front of fans except for the um, prisoners uh, before. So to play for them, a good couple of hundred fans and that. And I was like a local celebrity on the island at the time, so it was great. You know what, it's kind of emotional coming back here and that lump in the throat at the time and that. And just to see a couple of the old boys and all that, what was here when I used to play and that. You know what, coming a long way. I mean, the potential started getting better and better because he was getting into local games of quite a good standard and hold, not only holding his own, but was, became a firm favourite at Cows Football Club. We yeah, won the cup with Cows. Winning that cup for them for the first time for 26 years meant a hell of a lot. He was a hell of a player and, and I, well, I thought I could spot decent players, so I, I got hold of some contacts at Portsmouth and got them to come and watch. Um, I think they were just, the, they were a bit shy because of his background and what was going on. But I could tell he was a decent player and that he would make it. When I was released from Camp Hill, I had a few trials lined up for me at professional clubs. First and foremost, I went to the South End, but I never got nothing at South End. Barry Siltman got involved then, and he took me to Millwall. I played one game, but I wasn't fit enough at the time, so never signed there. Then um, he got me to Wimbledon, the crazy gang, which will probably have suited me a lot more than any other club. <laughs> but they offered 200 quid to stay in London as well, but I never, I never ended up taking that. And then he sent me up to Sunderland, which got me away from all the rubbish in London and it made me become a man overnight. I went up on a Sunday. Tuesday, I wanted to come home <laughs> because I was really homesick. Even though they put me in the hotel, I was lonely. I was there on my own, no one to talk to. It's like being in prison again, but a nice one. But then um, we trained Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We had a game against Leeds on the Thursday and you know when you played a good game. So, next day, Terry Bull just called me in the office and he's gone to me, you excite me, son, I'm gonna sign you. And that feeling there from being in prison like a couple of months before to getting signed at Sunderland was unreal. 10 months at Doncaster and 
I was in London again. Um, Barry Silkman rang me and said, um, Leicester, I want to sign you. So the next day I met him and drove me up to Leicester, had a medical, and I signed for 300 grand. I made my debut against Man City at Main Road. I remember the, it's raining puddles all over the place and that. And um, I actually um, got the assist for Mark Robbins, who signed along the same time as me, and won 1 0 at Main Road. And everyone was talking big things about me at the time. That's where Bradford come in. And I started well, started really well. Jamie Lawrence given a warm reception by not only the Bradford fans, but the Leicester supporters as well. The first few games we've done all right. And then it quickly went downhill because it wasn't living right. And then Cammy got the sack. And then Paul George took over. My first um, memory to Jamie, actually, is, is I had to take him for his medical. And he had that stupid pineapple haircut at the time. And we went down, he does all the scans and his x-rays, and he was all OK. And I came back and said, uh, uh, there's good news or bad news, he's passed, he's passed his medical, but he wants a second opinion on that pineapple on his head. And Jamie laughed, and uh, we got on fine ever since then. Great manager, great friend now, but man management skills as well, well second to none. And for me as a player as well, I wanted to play for him. You know, I'll run for a brick wall for him. Yeah, he was, he was a scallywag, you know, he had to keep... He, 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 he used to do shuttles to London every, every t too often for me. But I got, I, you know, I pulled him out and I said, look, I know what you're about, and I'm on you. So I think he did change his lifestyle. He certainly changed the... Uh, or he was realising that to be in our team, he, I had to, he had to be fit, and he had to cut out to socialise, and to, to a large extent, he did. Um, but, you know, you don't want to take that little bit of development away from people because part of the makeup is that excellent sense of that Jamie had. I know pre season, I've come back flying again. He, he's renewed my deal, he gave me a better money, a bit, um, another four year contract. And they was going to St. Kitts, the boys, and I was meant to go to St. Kitts tomorrow. So I'm, I'm winning all these races, 400 metres. I'm winding Gunnar Haller up because I'm sitting on his shoulder. And I'm just, at last bend, I'm just going away from him. The last run, I pulled my fire. So I said to him, Jay, you can't come, you want to stay behind and get some treatment at the, the Oxy Clinic. So I'm like, no chance. I'd met a bird in Iron Appa in the summer. That I said, I'm going to book a flight to Iron Appa. So I was ringing in every day saying, I'm sick, I'm sick. And then come, we come back 10 days later and Fidjo went to see the guy at the Yorkshire Clinic. He said, Jamie hasn't been anywhere near the clinic. Oh, that's strange. And I had an anonymous letter that so Jamie was seen and I and Appa with a young lady walking down it while we were away. They've come back from St Kitts now. We have a team photo. So we've done the team photo and then the gaffer's come and he's gone, Jay, need a word. So I pulled him. I looked him in his eyes and I said, Jamie, I've got a letter here. Two things are going to happen. I'm going to ask you a question. Were you and I in Appa? And if you tell me, if you tell me you were, I'm going to find you two weeks' wages and we'll move on. If you, tell, if you deny it and I find out it's true, you'll never play for me again. What, was it you? Yes, Gaffer. <laughs> it's... You know, we, we've laughed about it since, but I wasn't very happy, as you can imagine. But I think that even, you'll have to ask him that. I think that gave him excellent sense that he probably owed us a little bit. And uh, he certainly doesn't owe us anything now. He turned into a super professional. Um, he knuckled down and he was super fit and, and, and was a terrific player for us. Lawrence. Past Stimmets under the left foot. He's cut the beauty! What a goal! Look at this shot. Curled the ball absolutely beautifully. The team spirit and the honesty that the, the lads we had here kept us together that year. And it culminated in the last game of the season against Liverpool, who were trying to beat us to get in the Champions League. A bright, sunny day here at the Bradford and Bingley Stadium, which is known, of course, as Valley Parade. A full house and such a meaningful match for both sides. My mum and dad was in Jamaica. Um, I had a call saying that my dad's got cancer. 
and that is dying or whatever. So I went into the gaffer. I said, gaffer, um, my dad's dying. I don't know if I can play in this game. I basically said, just play this game as if you're playing for your dad. Like, even now, I think about it and I choke up. But um, I went out on a Sunday and I played like a man possessed. Lawrence, what a match he's had. Well, apart from the two centre-backs, he would be the other outstanding player today for me, Jamie Lawrence. So he did play with an excellent sense of... And, uh, yeah, he, he, he definitely... He definitely epitomised the spirit of us that day. Everyone's come and celebrate, which the boys never knew what was going on with me. And he's come over, whispered in my ear, like, that's for your dad. Like, tears running down my face and I had to walk, walk away from the boys and that and have a little cry to myself and that. And then um, a few months later, he died. The best club I've ever played for. Um, I still go back now because there's a club I have close to my heart. And the people, the, the fans, everyone around the club, it's like a family club. It make me feel so welcome when I'm there. It's like home away from home. After eventually calling time on my career, I decided it was time to give something back. I fell on the idea of like trying to help boys well come out of football clubs, trying to get them back into the game. And also um, bad, bad boys who have nothing to do, you know what I mean? So get them off the road and give them positive things to do. I've got my own football academy in South London. I try and rebuild them with their mentality and a work ethic and that, and try and get them back into football or just change their, their lives and that for the better. Because if you put your mind to anything, you can achieve anything. Football is a way of getting their attention, all right? Then I share my life stories about what I've been through and all that, and what I've done to turn it around. And I tell them, say, like, I'm lucky that I was able to turn it around, so it's better that they don't go down the same road I went down. I wanted to make a difference, all right? Um, Without certain people looking out for me, I would not be here today. And that just proved that there's some good people in the world and that. And I wanted to be, I wanted to do the same sort of things. I wanted to help people because people, you can earn all the money in the world, but it don't mean nothing. Right? When you help people, that means more to me than any money can buy. When I think about everything, I've turned a negative into a positive, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself, but there's still a lot of work to do with all these youngsters. Hopefully helping them is more rewarding than anything else. I'm so pleased he's done so much for the community and for kids, really. But Jamie was like that anyway. He'd always help anyone out. There's a lot of young kids at the moment that really could do with what Jamie's teaching them. I'm very pleased for Jamie, very pleased. You know, I, all right, I had a, a small hand in what he did and, and um, a bit of foresight with Dell to push that on. Uh, but he's done all the work himself outside. And I know Jamie thinks that Camp Hill has really helped him. And if we've done that, then that's, that's great. It's a great story. It really is a great story, how he's turned his life around. And he is an example to anyone who's thinking about going down the wrong road, Jamie Lawrence is a super example because he's not, he doesn't put it in your face, he doesn't, he's not pontificating about it, he, he's, he's been as low as he can get, and he's, he's bounced back high up, and he's here to help other kids not make the same mistakes as he did, but I'd love him to, to get a, a job at the top echelon of football because he deserves it. He's been through the mill, he's come through the other side, and he's a terrific example. 
sometimes where um, I've got pinched myself, like what I've been through. I reflect a lot on my life. And you know what? I would not change it. I wouldn't change nothing about my life because at the end of the day, that it makes me the man I am today. I'm a great believer of certain things happen for a reason. And I'm just glad that I turned it around and now people look at me like my mum and my kids. They look at me as a positive role model, not a negative one now. If it wasn't for football, I'd probably be in prison or a cemetery. There's no happy endings in that life. I couldn't thank all the people enough. Everyone standing by me, I owe you my life.